Hi, I'm Bruce Lewis, and I'm honored to be able to present the first part of the second video in our uh, series, Kingdom of God and Politics. I'm excited to share this lesson with this group. The world around us really doesn't seem interested in showing love and respect while disagreeing, but people watching this video do. Our first video centered on Jesus is our King. This video will help equip you to show the kind of love and respect the Bible calls for even when you're talking with someone you're sure is very wrong. Most of you are probably looking at the hostility in political discussions around us and deeply desiring a different heart for yourselves. There is too much bitterness and divisiveness out there. There may be a few of you, though, who are saying, Jesus rebuked people sometimes. Do I really need to always show love and respect? Give me a minute to address that issue. It's true, in Matthew 23, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and he doesn't pull any punches. According to the NIV translation, he calls them children of hell, blind fools, blind guides, full of greed and self-indulgence, whitewashed tombs, a brood of vipers. There's more name calling in that chapter than we see in the previous 22 chapters combined. So how do we know when it's time for name calling? That's hard to say exactly, but there are two things I want you to think about before you decide. The first thing to think about is how much Jesus engaged in reasoned dialogue with the Pharisees prior to Matthew 23. Here he's near the end of a ministry in which the gospel writers record about 30 interactions with the Pharisees, and he's about 33 years old. How old was he when he first started sitting among teachers at the temple, listening to them and asking them questions? Luke 2, 42 through 46 tells us he was doing that at age 12. So if you've been reasoning with someone for an hour, and you think it's time to go all Matthew 23 on them, you might be 21 years too early. The second thing to think about is why this public rebuke? If you look at the first 12 verses of Matthew 23, Jesus is warning everyone not to be like the Pharisees. And in verse 12, this culminates with, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Before you deliver a hot rebuke to anyone the way Jesus did to the Pharisees, Make sure you yourself aren't the Pharisee. In John 8, when they brought a woman caught in adultery to Jesus, who, who was all riled up with righteous indignation? The Pharisees. And who was stopping, writing on the ground, giving time for people to simmer down? Jesus. Do what Jesus would do and keep your cool. If you're still not convinced that love and respect should fill the vast majority of your conversations, go study it out. Right now, we're gonna move on. God gave us great tools to develop a conversational style of love and respect and to develop a mindset of love and respect. First, let's talk about a conversational style of love and respect. James 1, 19 through 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Most of you are sharing this message at a midweek, but if you're watching this video by yourself, it would do you a lot of good to click pause right now and spend five minutes just looking at and meditating on this scripture. In our conversations, we need to listen, really listen. Try to understand why they're saying what they're saying. Even when you think somebody's wrong, look for common ground that you share in what they're saying. And keep peace in your heart. What good does it do to get angry? Usually anger does harm, not good. Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Be slow to speak. And when you do speak, really think about what will help the other person. Okay, all that is easy to say, but it's hard to do. How do we get into a mindset to set us up for success in listening more than we talk, in not getting angry, in building others up according to their needs? The secret is in Romans 14. Starting in verse 1, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Okay, first some background. When you bought meat in first century Rome, you never knew whether it might have been offered in sacrifice to an idol. Christians who ate only vegetables showed how serious they were about avoiding idolatry. They could easily look at Christians who ate meat as having weaker convictions. Paul's perspective was that it's not what goes into your body that defiles you, but what comes from the heart. Christians who ate only vegetables had a weaker faith because they missed this important point. 
And guess what? Paul was right, and the Christians who ate only vegetables were wrong. Read Jesus in Mark 7.15 and Peter in Acts 10.15. Paul was right. There was a right side and a wrong side to this disagreement. But here's where Paul's different from me. He still called it a disputable matter. When I read about quarreling over disputable matters, my first thought is, no, I don't do that because I think of a disputable matter as one where there's no right or wrong answer, or maybe there is a right answer, but it isn't important. But here there's definitely a right answer, and it's a disagreement that touches on important issues like idolatry and freedom in Christ. So you'd think Paul would admonish people on the wrong side and tell others to admonish them too, but that's not what happens. Continuing in verse 3, he says, the one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Paul tells the people on the right side of the disagreement to avoid contempt and tells people on the wrong side not to judge. And he doesn't say you have no right to judge because you're wrong. He says you have no right to judge because that's God's job. Do you see how different Paul's thinking is from the thinking behind 21st century political discourse? Today, if we think the other side is wrong, does anybody say, don't treat them with contempt? Rarely. Media machines pump out contempt 24 hours a day. The messages from the world say, you don't have to show love and respect to those people, they're wrong. Don't listen to them, think like Paul. The world says, this issue is too important for you to talk about it with love and respect. Don't listen to them. Think like Paul. Paul's thinking is very different from what we see around us. And this is a short video. To let it sink in, please spend some time later looking at these scriptures yourself, especially the next verses. Starting in verse 5, one person considers one day more sacred than another, another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God, and whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Today, if two people disagree on something and I want them to get along, it's definitely not my first inclination to say that each should be fully convinced. I'm much more likely to say that they're taking things too seriously, they shouldn't hold their opinions so strongly, it isn't that important, but Paul doesn't think like me. Paul wants them to get along and be fully convinced of their own opinion. If you think Christmas is a great opportunity to honor God, then go ahead and be fully convinced to celebrate it. If you think Christmas is a pagan holiday, then be fully convinced and don't put any Christmas decorations up and don't pass judgment on one another. Continuing in verse 13, therefore let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Again, Paul's thinking is different from ours. He didn't say, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, then they're wrong, even though he was convinced they were wrong. Why? Because he had perspective. Yes, understanding how Jesus made all things clean is important, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit are more important. Righteousness is not being right. It is right relationships with God and others. With Jesus as our king and our allegiance to the kingdom of God over the kingdom of man, let's imitate Jesus in our conflicts by showing love and respect. In this series initiated by the Boston elders, evangelists, and teachers, the squad has presented lessons reminding us Jesus is king, The kingdom of God has our allegiance over the kingdoms of men, and disciples hold deep convictions with love and respect. For the conclusion, we look at how to resist the devil's efforts to divide us. God's desire is for unity. God's nature is three in one. 
when Jesus proclaimed the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he sent out the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In these few powerful words, Jesus announces the unified yet Trinitarian Godhood and proclaims his own deity as part of this Trinity. He also proclaims his intent for all people of all nations to know him. God's expectation is unity. The concept of unity comes up hundreds of times in the scriptures. God calls for it. Jesus prayed that it would define us, and Paul wrote clearly about it. One of my favorite examples of this is the letter to the church in Philippi. Unity is the overarching theme of this letter. It leaps from the pages in every section. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, calls the, for the Christian church to be a unified representation of the Trinity. Let's take a look at Philippians chapter 2. In verse 5, Paul writes, In your relationships to one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Paul challenges the Christians to pursue unity with one another in imitation of Jesus' humble pursuit of unity with the Father. Satan's work is division. Remaining in the writings of the Apostle Paul, let's now look at his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 6. Verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The word translated as schemes is methodia. It can also be translated as tactic, craftiness, strategy. Disunity is one of Satan's favorite schemes. In the Garden of Eden, Satan tempts Adam and Eve to separate from God. In the Gospels, he tempts Jesus to turn away from his father. And in Acts and the Epistles, there is a constant correction of disunity among the Christians. Just as we have an opportunity to demonstrate God's power through our radical unity, Satan has an opportunity through the issues happening in our world to achieve his goal, separate us from one another and ultimately from God. Hi, I'm Roger Lamb, part of the Boston Church Squad and I coordinate the squad in the Northwest region. We've heard some great things in these videos, and I'm so grateful that Daryl brought us back to that it's all about God. And now here's some great practicals that God has given us. You know, we live in an incredibly divided culture, and God has shown us how to not let Satan divide us. Here are five simple steps to keep in mind. Number one, the first step, is to agree that God is right. As disciples, we believe the word is truth. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The second step is to agree that opinions are not truth. Romans 14 reveals that opinions were dividing the church in Rome. The opinions were over a strongly held conscience issue, whether or not to eat meat that had been offered to idols and what days to observe as holy days. Both sides were passionately sure they were right and the other side was wrong. Paul writes to show us how opinions can divide us 
and how to not let opinions divide us. Here are the principles of Romans 14. A, don't treat each other with contempt and don't judge. When we show contempt and judge, we demonstrate that we're already wrong. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. B, it's not my job to change your mind about an opinion. I can share an opinion and I can respect others who are convinced about opposite opinions. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? C, perspective. We all will stand before God's judgment seat and each will give an account for our disunity. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. D, the goal is harmony, different parts making beautiful music together. Don't we all love our worship songs when everyone sings out in their different parts? So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. The third step is to follow Jesus, not men. Here's three scriptures. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There's no help for you there. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Follow Christ and follow the example of leaders only as they follow Christ. The fourth step is how to have spiritual discussions on controversial topics. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Once you've listened, empathize. What's the concern of the other person? Respect and understand their conscience about their own opinions. Once you've listened and empathized and validate, then point to Jesus. He did not engage in political discussions, but he always engaged in loving people. The fifth step is to love as Jesus loves. Love at all costs, in faith, unity, and opinions, liberty, and all things love. Love matters more than knowledge. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. Please note the additional resources that you have on your handout for you to pursue these concepts deeper and further. You know, all of us have made Jesus our Lord and Savior. A wise person once said, as long as what's right or left is more important to professing Christians than what is right or wrong in light of Jesus, we're doomed to present a caricature of him to the world. Christ is neither left nor right, nor is he a centrist. God seated him far above all rule and authority. Let's be a light and honor our Lord and Savior in these contentious times. Jesus preached in his Sermon on the Mount that we are the light of this world. The world needs a light. He also told his disciples that people would recognize them by what? By their love for one another. And we know that love builds up. We all want to build the kingdom of God, so let's do it together. Let's be a unified fellowship during a divided time. The points of the two lessons are pivotal to helping us navigate this season. One, Jesus is king of all of us, regardless of where you come from or what you think is best for our country. Jesus is king. Secondly, our allegiance is first to the kingdom of God over anything or anyone else. Thirdly, there's nothing better than to love and respect others, especially those we disagree with. And then fourth, of course, never let Satan divide. We pray these lessons added to your understanding of what it means to be a part of God's kingdom, builds our unity, and then lastly, equips us to reflect Jesus in this political season. I encourage you, hold on to your notes. Let's keep growing 
and let's be the light of this world at this time. Please join me in prayer as we finish. Father, please help us to honor and trust you above the culture and politics we live in. Lord, please help us to continue to grow in becoming more like you and loving each other. And Holy Spirit, please help us to grow deeper in the fruits of your spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And God, please lead us to avoid division and to be agents of unity to honor you. And in Christ's name, amen.